This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. The Search for Wisdom and the Light of Christ. The theme of our conference is Aquinas on Knowledge, Truth, and Wisdom. And my place in it, assigned by the organizer of the conference, is to start from what we've been investigating. That's a standard trope at, the, at the, uh, this workshop is to start by saying, the organizer of the conference just gave me this theme and it's, I don't know why it was assigned to me. So I'm gonna start in the same tradition and say, I don't know why this was assigned to me. Actually, I do. Um, my place in the conference is to start from what we've been investigating in the realm of philosophy, knowledge, truth, wisdom, and discuss how St. Thomas moves from there to an even higher perspective, or perhaps a better way to put it is how that already puts you on the trajectory towards a perspective that is not only philosophical, but also theological. So I'm going to start with a brief section speaking about how Aquinas conceives of the roles of philosophy and of divine revelation in our search for wisdom. Then in the second part, I'll discuss the light of natural reason and its relation to the light of faith. This is a subject that I think is um, not often discussed, or at least not discussed enough, and it's very interesting to me. Part three will go a bit deeper in exploring the light of faith itself, and then I will conclude with some brief remarks about how faith comes to us through Christ, the incarnate word of God. So the search for wisdom in the light of Christ, then. So part one is about Aquinas and the search for wisdom. The pursuit of wisdom, as I'm sure you know, is a primary and enduring theme across St. Thomas's works. But I think one of the best places to start in investigating this theme is in the first lines of the Summa Contra Gentiles. Aquinas begins that work by inquiring about wisdom and what the wise person does. And after some initial clarifications, he draws his first major conclusion, which is Text A on your handout. The name of wise, absolutely speaking, is solely reserved to one whose reflection is focused on the end of the universe, which is also the origin of the universe. Thus, according to the philosopher, it belongs to the wise to consider the highest causes. Now, this probably sounds rather familiar. I might note the implicit reference to exodus and reditus, something that People speaking about the structure of the Summa love to note. But what Aquinas says next is striking to me, at least. He constructs another syllogism right after this one with a conclusion that I think makes a nice capstone for our conference. This is text B, and it just follows almost uh, immediately after the lines in text A. The first author and mover of the universe is an intellect, as will be shown below. Therefore, the ultimate end of the universe must be the good of an intellect. But this is truth. Therefore, the truth must be the ultimate end of the whole universe. And wisdom principally strives after the consideration of it. And hence, divine wisdom testifies that he assumed flesh and came into the world to manifest the truth, saying, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. So the universe is caused by an intellect. That intellect acts for a good. And that ultimate end of its creative activity is the good of an intellect, namely the truth. And God wants that good for us too. He wants us to receive this good so much that he assumed flesh in Christ in order to bring us to the truth, to make us wise in the highest sense of that word. And so I think it's true to say that we're saved by wisdom. This then prompts Aquinas, very shortly after these lines I've been quoting, to exhort his readers to pursue this highest wisdom with all of their strength and every resource of their minds because he thinks this is the mind's very purpose 
and the true goal of any intellectual life. In fact, it's the true goal of any Christian life, too. This is text C. The pursuit of wisdom is more perfect, more sublime, more useful, and more joyful than all other human pursuits. It's more perfect because to the extent that man devotes himself to the pursuit of wisdom, he already has a certain share of true happiness. I hope you're sharing in that happiness at this conference. It makes me happy to be here with you and to talk about these things. He goes on, it's more sublime because through wisdom, man especially approaches to a divine likeness. I'm skipping some other things. Aquinas has a longer meditation than this, but just to get to the point, therefore, since likeness is the cause of love, the pursuit of wisdom especially joins one to God in friendship. That's actually extremely important, and I think you'll see as we come to the end of my presentation how we sort of return to this theme in our investigation of what the light of reason and ultimately also the light of faith and the light of glory are going to do for us. After speaking about wisdom in this way, Aquinas then clarifies, this is still in the opening chapters of the Summa Contra Gentiles, he clarifies that we know truths in different ways. Some truths about God, and he, he's principally interested in speaking there about the truths about God, but also truths about creatures as caused by God. But he says some truths about God can be reached by the power of natural reason, while others exceed every faculty of human reason, such as that God is three and one. He thinks it's, it's supremely important that we grasp these truths. In fact, to be truly wise, we'll need to grasp them, and our very salvation depends on them. But we can only accomplish this in a full way by faith. So at this point, we could go through a standard Thomistic account of the relation of faith and reason. Dr. O'Callaghan actually did a significant part of this in his talk, so happily I decided to omit this from my talk. I'll assume that you're generally familiar with it. And I will move on to focus on something that I think is not as well known, that is the relation between the light of reason and the light of faith. So this is part two, or point two in the talk. Aquinas on divine illumination in nature, grace, and glory. St. Thomas builds his account of the light of faith by starting with the foundational principle that man is made to know, and above all, to know the truth about God. You may recall that Aquinas actually puts this in uh, his description of the natural law. It's not just to know the truth, but if you look carefully at the text in the Summa where it talks about this, it's specifically to know the truth about God. Another quote from the beginning of the Summa Theologiae, the whole salvation of man which is in God hangs on the knowledge of this truth. In fact, this capacity to know God, and hence also to love him, is precisely where Aquinas locates the image of God in man. As Aquinas explains in a well-known text from the Summa Theologiae, which I'm not going to quote, there are three ways or degrees of the image of God in the human creature. The first is that as rational... Man has a capacity to know and love God as the cause of the universe. The second degree of the image consists in the conformity of grace. When a person begins to know and love God in act, in this life, but imperfectly. And the third degree of image consists in the likeness of glory insofar as man knows and loves God in act and perfectly in the glory of heaven. Often unnoticed, however, Aquinas draws a close parallel between these three degrees of the divine image and the three lights by which God illuminates man's mind. So consider this text, which is an exegesis of Psalm 3510, uh, which reads, In your light we see light. So Aquinas is commenting on this line from the Psalms, and this is text D. 
the rational creature sees in the light of God. We do not mean a light created by God. So this light is not a, it's not a light created by God, which is what Genesis 1 speaks of, let there be light. Rather, we see in your light, namely that by which you shine, which is a likeness of your substance. Brute animals do not participate in this light, but the rational creature does. First, in natural knowledge. For man's natural reason is nothing other than the brilliance of divine splendor in the soul, on account of which splendor man is in the image of God. The light of your countenance is signed upon us, O Lord. The second is the light of grace. Rise up, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. The third is the light of glory. Arise, be enlightened, O Jerusalem, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Note what St. Thomas asserts here. The human creature is made in the image of God because he participates in the very divine light by which God himself shines. And that participation has three degrees or modalities, the light of natural reason, the light of grace, and the light of glory. Now, in making this claim, what we're seeing Aquinas do is synthesize an Aristotelian anthropology and epistemology with an Augustinian illuminationism, with, as well, a kind of Proclan Dionysian cosmology of hierarchies, especially if we added angels to the picture, we would see that in the picture. So while we are stably endowed with the light of reason in virtue of our rational nature, this is nonetheless also rightly considered a form of divine illumination, which is a participation in the divine light. Okay, so how are these three lights, the light of reason, the light of grace, the light of glory, related to each other? Aquinas speaks of them as having different strengths. That's his word. He says, for example, quote, the natural light of the intellect is strengthened through the infusion of the light of grace. And also, quote, the light of grace perfects the light of nature. And the light of glory, he says, is more perfect yet. Quote, the superabundant light of glory puts to flight every shadow, not, however, by taking away nature, but by perfecting the intellectual light which is participated in us defectively by our nature. End quote. So we might think of these three lights in terms of the mind's ascending participation in the infinite and perfect light, which is God himself. So going from the partial, and in the case of man after the fall, the defective participation of man's mind according to nature, through a higher participation by grace, culminating in the highest participation, which is that of glory. So what does this help us to see? It means that although we have to distinguish the light of reason from the light of grace, they are not two entirely different or completely unrelated lights, nor is their relationship horizontal, as if the domain of reason is over here, and then the domain of faith is over here, and you want to know things both over here and over there. Rather, Aquinas portrays the relation between them as hierarchical and complementary. Now, he describes these as intellectual lights. He's very clear that they are not physical lights, like the light produced by the sun. But we do understand them by analogy to physical light. Aquinas writes, quote, light, insofar as it pertains to the intellect, is nothing other than a certain manifestation of the truth, end quote. And so, in a sense, spiritual light is more properly light than the physical light of the sun. 
The highest light, light in the most full sense, is the purely intellectual light that is God himself. So the light of reason in itself is a weaker light, or as Aquinas puts it more precisely, it's weaker in us because of the way that we, as rational animals, have a rational soul that is the form of a body. In contrast, angels have an intellect not united to a body, and they know what is universal and intelligible more directly, which means that they participate by their nature in the divine light to a higher degree than we do by our nature. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas explains that the natural light of reason in us is adapted to our bodiliness since we encounter reality first through our bodies and then abstract what is universal and intelligible from matter. We've been talking a lot about that. Just as light makes the aspect of an object visible to our eye so that our eye perceives whatever of the object is visible, so also the natural light of reason illuminates what is intelligible in what we perceive so that our mind sees deeper into that reality than sense perception alone is capable of doing. So when physical light is present, it gives us, through our eyes, a certain access to the reality that is around us by a sensation, vision, that is essentially different from touch and hearing. And likewise, when the light of reason shines on the phantasm that our intellect produces from what it senses, our mind grasps something of an essentially different order than bodily senses. The mind sees what is intelligible in the object. This is just repeating, or maybe saying in, in a slightly different way, maybe incorrectly, some uh, things that we've discussed in great detail earlier in the conference. Thus, the light of reason really does give us something new and of a different order. And I think this is an important point that's been implicit in some of, the, some of our discussions. There's no anterior explanation or justification on which the evidence of this intellectual grasp rests beyond the light of reason itself. So that's going to be helpful when we start talk about faith. Even in the, the realm of reason, there is something a little mysterious there about what is the, the foundation for intellectual judgments. In the same way, Aquinas also then speaks about a supernatural light of faith by which one grasps something of a different order than what both sense and natural reason can access. So if, if sense accesses one realm on the animal level and then natural reason gives us something actually intellectually intelligible on a higher level, the light of faith gives us something a higher level yet again. So the light of faith is a supernatural illumination by which the believer gives an unqualified and unconditional assent to what has been proposed for belief. And this is what distinguishes faith from, on the one hand, scientia, or certain knowledge, where the mind sees the truth directly by the light of natural reason. So one would say with scientia, I know it's true because I see the truth of it. So that's one thing that faith is distinct from. And on the other hand, faith is distinct from opinion, where the mind gives only a qualified assent to what is proposed. So, for example, the mind would say, I think this is probably true, but I'm not entirely sure. In Aquinas's view, the light of faith puts our mind in contact with a reality, God himself, that is more knowable in itself, but is less known to us because our embodied intellects only know naturally what we encounter through and have abstracted from our senses. Okay, so now this is part three. So more going a little deeper to speak about the light of faith specifically in relation to the act of faith. In order to further understand the light, the light of faith, we should situate it in relation to the act of faith. So there's much that could be said here 
and I'm just going to summarize a lot of material so that we can focus on the light. For Aquinas, there are two preconditions for an act of faith. First, something must be proposed to a person for belief. And second, the person must judge that what is proposed is believable or credible. So I'm just going to skip over this important topic and move directly to the act of faith itself, presupposing that we have this in the background. On Aquinas' view, the human mind, unaided by grace, cannot make a genuine act of supernatural faith. If it's unaided by grace, it cannot make an unaided, uh, it cannot make an act of supernatural faith. Not even when it hears a message and sees confirming miracles, confirming signs. So, Aquinas remarks, many people heard Christ preaching and saw his miracles, but did not believe. A properly supernatural act of faith only results, according to Aquinas' mature teaching, when God moves the mind by grace to believe the word of a witness without qualification, even though the new believer does not himself see the truth directly. So this movement of the will by God is neither the light of faith, not yet, we're not talking about the light of faith yet, we're just talking about a movement given by God's grace. It also is not yet a movement of charity, so it's God moving the will, but it isn't the theological virtue of charity. Rather, it's what the Second Council of Orange calls the credulitatis affectum. It's a first movement of the appetite for a supernatural good. In other words, after one hears a saving message exteriorly, you hear the message, God interiorly moves the will to turn away from lower creaturely goods so as to desire and, as it were, reach out for a promised supernatural good, a good that surpasses what human nature could know, desire, or achieve of its own power. And in this, God activates or moves the affection of the will to rely on the truthfulness, uh, to, to, to move the intellect to rely on the truthfulness of God who speaks the message. So this first movement of the will would seem to correspond precisely to what Aquinas describes in his treatise on grace in the Summa Theologiae and in many other places as a turning or a conversion of the fallen creature's mind back towards God in order to be illuminated by the light of grace. And that's why I think this, it seems to be a kind of metaphor that Aquinas systematically uses. I mean, it's not only Aquinas, it's a very traditional way to speak about uh, what's happening. But Aquinas systematically builds it into his account of the act of faith. And I think it's very helpful to help us understand how the light of faith is given or is working. Though man's intellect is made to know, and especially made to know God, sin causes our intellects to be darkened, such that even the light of natural reason becomes obscured in some degree. This is because sin introduces disorder into the soul. The soul is no longer subject to God, and therefore the lower powers in man, like his concupiscible desires, are no longer subordinate to man's higher powers, like reason, and sometimes they even impede reason's exercise. So this is text E, where Aquinas just summarizes that through reason, through, sorry, through sin, the reason is dimmed, especially in practical matters. The will is hardened, less sensitive to the good. A greater difficulty in doing good arises, and concupiscence is more and more inflamed. So we see less clearly the will becomes numb to the real good. We have a hard time doing the good that we do perceive, and we are constantly drawn away towards other goods, even ones that we know are not good for us. 
even after we cease from the act of sin, the effects of our past sins remain in the soul. And Aquinas describes this as, quote, a blemish on the brightness of the soul. You notice the light and obscurity uh, metaphor here. It's a blemish on the brightness of the soul on account of its withdrawing from the light of reason or the divine law. And therefore, as long as man remains out of this light, the stain of sin remains in him. So sin is described by Aquinas as a turning away from the light, stepping into darkness, and occluding what should be luminous, if you had like a crystal ball, covering it with some kind of black tar or something like that. So it's, it's no longer able to be luminous the way it was meant to be. The soul loses the light of grace entirely, and this also causes the natural light of reason in us to be obscured to some degree, although it's not entirely obliterated. So Aquinas then says, obscurity of mind follows from sin, insofar as man is impeded from considering intelligible things through a preoccupation with sensible things. He sometimes describes this as falling into the senses. So you, your mind has a harder time thinking about purely intelligible things. Now sin, according to Aquinas, impacts not only intellect, but also the will and man's other appetites. Your desires become fixated and inflamed by the lower goods of the senses, higher spiritual goods lose their savor. Okay, so why are we talking about this? Because it's important to understand what's happening in the light of faith and, and what it's doing for the soul to help correct the real existential situation we find ourselves in with a light of reason that is not entirely in charge. So what happens when the sinner has a conversion? Aquinas takes the language of conversion, a turning, literally, the sinner is turned towards God by God's own initiative. And this is a turning towards the light, the light of grace, so that one's mind then will be illuminated by the light of faith. So this is text F. To prepare oneself for grace is, as it were, to be turned to God. Just as whoever has his eyes turned away from the light of the sun pre prepares himself to receive the sun's light, by turning his eyes toward the sun. Hence it is clear that man cannot prepare himself to receive the light of grace, except by the gratuitous help of God moving him inwardly. So the man who was previously disordered in his soul, turned away from God, fixated on creative and sensible goods, is now turned back by God's initiative toward the divine light who is God himself. And this has two dimensions or aspects one of them could be described in standard scholastic terminology as an actual grace, that is a divine motion in the soul by which God moves the will to direct the intellect to assent to what is proposed for belief. That's the turning. And then secondly, concomitant with that actual grace of turning, the soul is now flooded with light. So as it turns, it turns towards the light and it receives the light. So this is the infusion of a new and supernatural light into the mind in the habitus of faith. And it's this illumination that cleanses and perfects the soul. Okay, so that's the general picture. Now I'd like to consider some of the obscurities in the light of faith. I mean, not obscurities understood in the light of faith, but the obscurities in Aquinas' teaching on the light of faith. Okay, so to begin, if the mind does not directly see the truth that is to be believed, in what sense then is faith called a light? Aquinas takes this up in the Secunda Secundae of the Summa Theologiae, where we find his mature teaching on the light of faith. Just after he's explained that in faith neither the senses nor the intellect directly sees its object, he clarifies, and this is text G, the light of faith makes seen the things that are believed. For as though, as through the other habitus of virtues, a man sees that which is fitting to him according to that habitus, thus also through the habitus of faith, 
The mind of man is inclined to assent to those things that befit a right faith and not to assent to others. St. Thomas's point is that the light of faith as a supernatural virtue or habitus puts the believer's mind in real contact with the object of faith, which is God, under the aspect of first truth. Because of the infusion of this habitual gift of supernatural light, the believer now has a real relationship with God, and hence a new supernatural sense of who God is and what he is like. This new capacity to judge rightly in matters of faith works like the other virtues. So, a person with the virtue of chastity has a sense by which that person can judge whether a relationship is endangering chastity. Aquinas talks about that. Maybe that's explaining, the, uh, explaining something by something less, less known, but hopefully uh, you are familiar with this kind of effect of virtue. So the chaste person may not be able to fully explain why this relationship is unchaste, but he sees somehow that it's not consistent with virtue. Faith works in the same way, according to Aquinas. Although the light of faith does not add new intelligible content to the mind, so the mind still needs what's proposed for belief to come from outside, for example, you, you hear the gospel, still the mind acquires a new light by which it can judge rightly whether what that Dominican is saying from the pulpit corresponds to the truth about God, whom the believer knows. And in this sense, the light of faith really does illuminate the mind, even though the believer does not see the object of faith directly. A few articles later, Aquinas formulates an objection, as an objection, an argument that today we often find on the lips of contemporary skeptics. It goes like this. Faith is dangerous because in faith one abandons what is characteristic of the life of reason. So here's how Aquinas formulates it. It's dangerous for man to assent if he cannot judge whether what is proposed to him be true or false. But man cannot make such a judgment in matters of faith since he cannot resolve them into their first principles. Actually, I was reading in... Um, Kant's essay on what is enlightenment, and he makes a very similar uh, claim. So Aquinas replies uh, this way. This is text H. Just as man assents to first principles by the, light of, by the natural light of his intellect, so also a virtuous man, by the habit of virtue, judges rightly of what pertains to that virtue. Likewise, in this way, by the light of faith divinely infused in man, he assents to the things that pertain to faith and not to their contraries. Consequently, there is no danger or condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, illuminated by Christ through faith. So that's also very interesting. We're getting another little clue as to how to understand the light of faith. The light of faith, Aquinas suggests, functions in a manner analogous to how we grasp the truth of the first principles of natural reason. You don't construct an argument to prove the principle of non-contradiction. It's per se nota to an intellect endowed with the light of natural reason. And in the same way, for the believer, when the light of faith is infused into the mind, the believer is able to judge rightly that the primary articles of faith proposed to him should be believed. For example, that God is our ultimate happiness and exercises providence over all things. So this is not a demonstration but Aquinas says a kind of, quote, implicit cognition or, quote, a gaze in two e two of the mind. So faith on Aquinas' account doesn't involve an abandonment of reason, nor is it dangerous to assent to what faith proposes, because it involves a knowledge of higher truths by a higher light. And then we can conclude this point with another quote from Aquinas, nor should we be surprised, he says, if these things are not evident to non-believers who do not have the light of faith, because neither would the first principles of natural reason be evident 
without the light of the agent intellect. So it's important to avoid misunderstanding what Aquinas is saying. It's sometimes thought that faith infuses new cognitive content into the mind. That's not what he's saying. God speaks to us exteriorly, exteriorly through divine revelation. He can give the gift of prophecy to some people uh, in a supernatural gift of knowledge, but that's distinct from the interior light of faith. That light has a particular function in what we can call the supernatural organism of grace. It elevates the mind so that it ascends to the articles of faith with certitude, but it doesn't give the articles of faith to the mind. So this is why Aquinas says that the light of faith itself does not pertain to the intellect's cognition, properly speaking. Another quote, faith does not extend to cognition of those things that are believed, but that man assents with certitude to those which are known by others. In other words, we cannot in this life directly see the object of faith, but by the light of faith we believe to be certainly true what God and the blessed see directly. And so to the extent that we have any cognition of those truths, we have it by participation in what is known directly by others. Despite being a most certain light, Aquinas adds that faith does leave the mind in a certain obscurity. And this also is a helpful thing to think about. It's also helpful pastorally, by the way, if you're talking to people about struggles uh, in their life of faith. So it is proper to God to be light. Aquinas says God is light by essence. But he goes on, but because God dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has ever seen, we are not able to approach him. So that the obscurity or darkness of faith results from the weakness of our intellects, which are not able to transcend the limits of our bodily way of knowing while we remain in this life. Our way of thinking remains dependent, dependent on phantasms, for example, so that while faith has God as its object, yet, quote, the human intellect cannot in the present state of life understand even immaterial created substances, much less can it understand the essence of God, end quote. Because faith doesn't totally remove the imperfections of our weak intellects, it therefore leaves our minds restless so that we still hunger for a clearer vision. And this is text I. The simple light, which is faith, causes its perfection, namely its ascent. But insofar as that light is not perfectly participated, it does not totally remove the imperfection of the intellect, and so the movement of thought remains restless in it. End quote. So even with the light of faith... The mind doesn't rest. We don't have a direct vision of God. So the mind, which wants to see, continues to churn. It continues to try to work. And it leaves us not entirely satisfied with our state because we desire to know fully. We want to see. We still feel as if we remain in a certain darkness. But this is a normal experience of faith, says Aquinas. We should not be troubled by it. We should not be troubled if questions arise in our minds, which we do not immediately find answers to. These questions are not, properly speaking, doubts, as long as our firm assent to the truth of the faith doesn't change. Notwithstanding all of this about the obscurity of the faith or the restlessness that it leaves our minds with, Aquinas teaches that faith has a more powerful and deeper effect on the human being than other sorts of knowledge and in several ways. I'll just try to briefly catalog them here, and we're, we're almost at the end of the, of the talk. So, the powerful and deeper effect. First, faith gives us much more than knowledge or facts about God. It puts us in real contact with God himself. And Dr. O'Callaghan made reference to this about coming to know your spouse. I think that's actually a very nice way to put it. A historian knows his wife in a very different way than he knows Napoleon, no matter how many facts he knows about Napoleon. He might actually in a certain way know more facts about Napoleon's childhood than he knows about his wife's childhood, but that doesn't mean that he knows Napoleon better. 
Second, in the normal case, that is where man imposes, interposes no obstacle, the gratuitous infusion of faith comes with the simultaneous infusion of the other theological virtues of hope and charity in the gift of sanctifying grace. And that means that faith in its normal way of operating, now there are exceptions where there's an obstacle due to sin, but in the normal case, faith's illumination of the intellect causes man to, quote, burst forth into love. That is, faith has a a natural trajectory? No, actually, it's a supernatural trajectory towards charity. The more we know God in faith, the more we will love him. And this then becomes a virtuous circle. The more we draw close to him in charity, the more we grow in knowledge of him. Third uh, point. It is a capital teaching of Aquinas, although often insufficiently appreciated in my opinion, that when a person receives sanctifying grace, the divine persons are sent to and truly dwell in the soul in person. So the Son is sent, the Holy Spirit is sent, according to faith, which is the created effect by which our souls are assimilated to the personal properties of the Son, and charity, by which we are assimilated to the personal properties of the Holy Spirit. So as your intellect comes through living faith to know God as he knows himself, you are made like God. You are also made like the divine word who proceeds from the Father by way of intellect, and you are assimilated to the word as well as to the Holy Spirit who proceeds by, by way of charity. Okay, this brings me to my concluding point. This is the last point. Faith comes from Christ. In a certain way, this brings us back to our starting point. We're saved by divine wisdom which comes to us through the incarnation of the word. So this is text J. This splendor of the Father's glory, the image of fontal light, took on our flesh and did many glorious and divine works in this world. The gospel is therefore the declaration of this light. Hence the gospel is also called the knowledge of the brightness of Christ, which knowledge has the power to enlighten. But there's something even more fundamental than the fact that the historical revelation of God in Jesus of Nazareth and what he did and suffered are the foundation for our faith, which we hear in the preaching of the church. Something even more fundamental, faith is from Christ insofar as through the instrumentality of his human nature, he is the source of every grace of illumination that we receive. Aquinas really thinks that they all pass through Christ, through his sacred humanity. Quote, the humanity of Christ has the power of infusing grace insofar as it is conjoined to the word of God, Aquinas says. And this is an aspect of Christ's headship over the church. He is truly the light of men, as John's gospel says. Quote, and this is Aquinas, according to the influx of grace, since we are illuminated by Christ. Aquinas means that even the interior illuminations we receive by grace, here and now, are from Jesus as God and as man. Quote, some teachers teach only from without, but Christ also instructs from within. And another quote, all spiritual understanding, all gifts, in short, whatever can exist in the church. All of this, Aquinas writes, is super abundantly in Christ and flows from him into the church's members, end quote. I will now conclude with a striking quotation. It's perhaps a provocative one. But it's a quotation from Aquinas himself, one of his academic sermons preached in Paris late in his career about the high dignity of faith, speaking about how we should become students, disciples of God. Quote, God illuminates the intellect through faith. This is the best instruction. It is a greater thing that a man have a modicum of faith than to know everything that all the philosophers of the world knew. Thank you.